You're, You're listening to the Project Ignite podcast, where real digital entrepreneurs reveal their very best tips, tools, and strategies to help you ignite and grow your online business. ProjectIgnite.com. Your digital business starts here. Now, here's your host, Derek Gale. Welcome to the Project Ignite podcast, a podcast designed to skip the hype, skip all the BS, and bring you real actionable tips and strategies from people that are actually doing stuff, real experts. Uh, this is your host, Derek Gale, as always. And and uh, today we're going to be talking about something that I'm pretty passionate about, and that is persuasion and influence. And this is a topic I've studied passionately for the past 20 plus years as an entrepreneur and a marketer. And uh, look, guys, if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, your ability to persuade and influence is critical whether that's talking to customers, whether that's talking to your staff, whether that's trying to raise money, whatever that is, everything you do as a business leader, as an entrepreneur, there's a level of influence that is going to dictate your success. And, you know, I hear people say all the time, oh, I don't like selling. I don't like persuading. And, and many people think it's almost a dirty word. And, and, and it, you have to reframe that in your mind because when you're in business, business is about persuading, convincing, selling your ideas, your products. And that's why I'm looking forward to today's guest. Uh, he is a professor of communication, speaker, and author of the best-selling book, How to Read Minds and Influence People, where he explores communication from a very different perspective and uh, unlocks the science of reading people and helps people harness that power of persuasion. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Carl Christman to the show. Carl, thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you for having me. So, all right. Um, you know, I'm always curious, uh, before we get into actual influence, how people find their thing in life and how did you, how, how did you end up going down this road and becoming this you know this this expert on influence and persuasion well like a lot of people i didn't really plan it there was no master plan it was just i stayed in school so i finished high school didn't want to get a job so i went to college finished college didn't want to get a job so i went to graduate school and then end up focusing on this and I just kind of get more and more focused. And so the higher you get in education, the more focused yeah. you get in one specific area. And the area that I was just drawn to was communication and psychology and how I can actually kind of get inside people's minds and figure out what they're really thinking and then hopefully influence them for the better. As you mentioned, uh, it, it sometimes gets a bad rap all about sales and influence, but I, I think this is the most important thing we do trying to influence people. Now, hopefully we want to influence them positively. And so that's a lot of what I've been looking at uh, over my career. How can we help make people's lives better by making, making them make good decisions or kind sure. of nudging them in that direction? Yeah. And, and that's interesting that you say that because I mean, people that are experts at persuasion can, you know, you can use that power for good or you can use it for <laughs> For evil. And uh, I mean, you know, I always go back to that and I rewatched the movie a few weeks ago. Great movie, but just a terrible dude. And that was the Wolf of Wall Street. Right. Like, I mean, yep. you know, I mean, absolute, uh, you know, great persuader. And uh, to the to the point that, you know, he he persuaded people to to go against their beliefs. And, and it still amazes me. Um, but I mean, he's out selling his own persuasion and sales training now, too, which just I don't know. I shake my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So look, let's, let's start at the beginning. And uh, you know, one of the, one of the things I hear from people is I hate selling and uh, I hate, I hate persuading. I hate selling um, and I'm not good at it. And let's face it. I mean, th there are people in the world that are naturally, I think, better at persuasion than others. Right. But is it something that can be learned? Is it an academic process that somebody who's not a good salesperson can learn, you think? Absolutely, you can learn it. And what I go over in the book is some steps to persuasion and some keys to persuasion. Uh, but for people that really say they're not into it, they just hate doing it, I've often found that's because they don't really truly believe in their product. Right. Right. There's a lot of things where if it's just a paycheck, I, 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 my first job after high school was selling Cutco knives. 
and I had to sell these knives to people and uh, it was awful Yeah. because I, I didn't believe in it because they were knives. What do sure. I care? Yeah. But when it comes to my, I mean, right now on this, on this podcast, I am selling my experience, my knowledge, my book. I believe in it because I put so much time into it. Mm-hmm. So if you really believe in it, it makes it so much easier. And uh, I have a friend who works selling uh, timeshares mm-hmm. and I personally could not do it because I don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. So what he said he did when he first went there was he had to go through, he had to experience it himself. And then he had to go over the numbers and make sure that he could find a way of justifying it. Because if it's just, if the only reason I'm selling this is because I want to make a paycheck, it's a lot harder to sell. Sure. But when he finally justified it to himself, oh, this is how I'm going to help people improve their lives by taking time together, building a relationship. Then he could justify it and then he could sell it. So the most important thing is you just, you actually have to believe what you're saying. Otherwise, not only is it not ethical, but it's a lot harder to, to get yourself into it. True. But once you truly believe in it, then absolutely there's something can be learned. There are some people that just have a, a gift for interacting with others. If you're more shy, it's probably going to be a little bit more of a struggle. My, my brother-in-law sells real estate and is very good at it, but he's an introvert and hates every minute of it. Mm-hmm. So he has to give himself pep talks before he has open houses. Mm-hmm. But he follows the steps. He does a great job. Uh, so anyone can learn it. It's easier for some, but there, if you just follow the steps, it's just like anything else in life. There's a formula. Yeah. And, and, you know, to the listeners that are out there, I mean, I'm, I'm an introvert. Um, and, uh, you know, that being said, I've learned persuasion. And now, you know, over the past 20 years, I've spoken on stages to probably over 100,000 people, you know, and I've sold tens of millions of dollars persuading people yeah, from absolutely. the stage how to do that, right? So, you know, if you're an introvert or you are shy, I mean, shy, you have to kind of get over that, right? You have to push yourself out yeah. of your comfort zone. Introvert's different than shy. Um, but if you're an introvert, you can still do this. Um, so, all right. So let's, uh, there, there's one, there's one, uh, I want to talk about the title of your book, right? Yes. Um, and one specific thing that you say in there, and that is how to read minds. Absolutely. Well, yeah, first of all, tell with, me about that. All right. Well, so first of all, with the title, I obviously took that from a far more famous previous book. Uh, and I love it when people come up to me and say, oh, I love your book. I read it in the 80s. It was great. And I have to stop and take stock and say, boy, if you think I wrote a book in the 80s, I need to take better care yeah. of my skin. But <laughs> yes, uh, I, it's just to, to catch people, the whole idea of reading minds. Mm-hmm. And basically the idea here is, you're basically trying to get inside other people's minds and figure out what they're thinking. The problem with a lot of people when it comes to sales is it's all me oriented. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want to sell. Here's my information, what I'm going to give to you. And they forget the whole process of listening and figuring out what the other person is actually going through. So it's got to be audience focused, audience centered, so you can deliver what they want. So one of the first things, or actually I should say the first thing, is to try and read the audience and figure out what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And to do this, it's called empathetic accuracy, which empathy is, I feel what you're going through. I I understand. Sympathy is, I feel bad for you. Empathy is, I feel what you're experiencing. So empathy is, I I know what you're thinking. Empathetic accuracy is, I can do that correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they found in studies that children as, as young as six months old can do this. They can look at their parents and they can figure out they're happy, they're sad, there's something going on. Because by doing that, they're able to figure out how do I get what I want? Food, drink, something else. Uh, And and small children can do that. We are so much better at at doing that as adults. Basically looking at other people and trying to figure out based on their facial expressions, the micro expression, body language, posture, how they're sitting, how they're standing. What are they experiencing? Basically, if I were them right now, what would I be going through? And so once you know what people are actually thinking, you can overcome their objections. You can figure out how to fulfill their needs. You can figure out what sales strategy is best to help move the conversation forward. Okay. So, so let's say you sit down with somebody to sell them a product. Um, uh, and I guess this is, this is digging into the, the process, right? Yeah. Um, I, I assume before you start, you know, sharing your product, it's about them first and getting to know them. 
how do you how do you extract that information out of them? What are you looking for? Is it physical? Is it through a line of questioning? You know, kind of walk us through this process. So uh, I, I approach this almost like a psychic would. Okay. If you ever go and have a palm reading done or a psychic reading, what you'll find is they're able to tell you a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're just being hyper observant. They're noticing all sorts of things about you. So if you take someone's hand, do a palm reading. It's not about the, the lines. It's about what kind of ring do they have? What's their nail polish? Uh, are they hard hands? Are they rough? Are they soft? So just by focusing on all of those things, you can tell a lot about people. I can look at someone's hands and tell what kind of work they do, uh, how they want to come across. Are they affluent? Uh, do they want to seem very manicured? So it, it's taking things like that and just looking at people. So when it comes to process, I start with what I can see about people and then use that to start a conversation. I can't look at someone and it's not a uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of, here's a whole profile. It's look at them. I should move the conversation in that general direction. Mm -hmm. So then a lot of it's just listening. I want to ask questions. I want to talk to them. And I'm going to use all these physical cues about how they appear, how they're behaving, uh, how they look at this particular moment to try and start the conversation. And hopefully that helps me build rapport. We get along better because I'm truly, honestly interested in what they're going through. And then as we're talking, I'm looking for micro expressions. I'm looking for all sorts of tells that tell me what they truly think about it. Uh, and so micro expressions are this basic, very quick facial reaction, facial expressions that people exhibit when they're, they're facing this tension. And the tension is between being polite and being honest. And we all try to be very, very polite. And even if it's a salesperson and they don't really wanna be there, they're not gonna be rude most of the time. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna lie. And so what we need to be doing is looking for those little expressions. Uh, the, the example I use oftentimes is if I were to invite you to my house for dinner mm -hmm. and I were going to cook for you, if I were going to cook for you, you would hate the food <laughs> because I'm, I'm vegan and I don't cook very well. It would be a miserable experience for you. But if I asked you how the food was, you would probably look straight in my eyes and lie. So what I'm looking for is that, that micro expression. When I say, oh, how's dinner? I'm going to see this. Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's that instantaneous truthfulness before re people realize that's not socially acceptable. I should be nice. I should be polite here. Mm -hmm. So when I present a product or a service or some sort of pitch before they blow me off, I'm looking for was there interest there? Is that an automatic? No, I want to figure out what what part of it they have an, object an objection to mm -hmm. so I can try and hopefully overcome that. Okay. And so uh, the tells, the, yes. the, the micro expressions, uh, is there a set list of standard ones that you're looking for that are obvious? There are. So there's, there's seven common facial expressions okay. that correspond to emotions that are universal. And we know that because every culture they're exactly the same and even people who've been blind from birth use them and they're obvious you, you got surprise happy sad anger contempt uh fear so that doesn't really help them. They're, they're so broad yeah now you can look at the specific specific muscles there's about 450 different combinations and you can look at these mm -hmm. but the the main thing here is to almost just use intuition and don't try to analyze it. There's, there was a famous show, Lie to Me, years ago. And in it, they would look at each of the possible combinations to figure out when people are lying. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot more easy. It's a whole lot easier than that. Mm -hmm. You're basically just looking for intuition and asking yourself, if I were that person right now, how would I feel? Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at your face, I, well, your, your eyebrows are a little bit kind of together. Your uh, smile, the, the corners of the lips are a little bit down. I can look at things like that and try to figure out, oh, last time I looked like that, how did I feel? What would I be going through? And that's the whole point of empathy. So yes, to, long story short, there are specific tells you can look for. But the easiest thing is just to look and ask yourself, how would I feel at this point? And the easiest way to learn this 
is through practicing. Yeah. Now, uh, in, in my sessions on my website, I've got a, a list of, or a, a quiz where you can go through and kind of test yourself. And mm-hmm. there'll be pictures of people's eyes. It actually comes from an Oxford researcher who was testing autistic children to figure out if they could pick up social cues. Yeah. And basically, look at the person right now. How do you think they're feeling? And you can kind of test yourself and figure out what's going on there. Mm-hmm. However, in everyday life, the easiest way to do this is to look at someone, try to figure out, oh, I think this is what they're going through. Yeah. And then start a conversation and figure out, ask them, is this what you're going through? So uh, I deal with students, or at least when there's not a pandemic and we're not all <laughs> from home, I deal with students in person. Yeah. And when I see a student who their face looks different than normal, mm-hmm. uh, there's just something going on. So I'll stop. How are you doing? Anything going on? And either they'll tell me yes, and then we get into that. So I picked up the clue correctly, mm-hmm. or sometimes I'm wrong. So just through this process of repetition of practicing, we get yeah. better at reading people. Uh, and so I, I wish I, I could give you the exact, here's what you look for in the face, sure. but it, it's basically just empathy uh, and, and then starting the conversation and leading it that direction and seeing if you're right. You know, it's funny when you say that, I, I think I think about it, I'm like, you're right. As humans, we're very good at reading facial expression. But I think what happens in many cases is you get people who are sitting down with somebody or a group to influence them, and they're so focused on their message and themselves, they're not taking the time to sit back and have that ask the question of, okay, what is what is this face telling me, right? How are they responding to it? Because we do, we do recognize emotion, right? Absolutely. And part of that is just spending the time to get kind of a baseline. So uh, when you do a lie detection test, mm-hmm. first thing they'll do is they'll ask you a series of questions that they know the answers to. What's your name? Yeah. Uh, what's the date? Where are we? Because they need to have that baseline. Mm-hmm. Same thing when we're interacting with people. Uh, you need to know what's going on with them. So if I, if I meet someone and they look angry, well, I don't know if they're actually angry or if that's just their face. Yeah. So <laughs> I need to take a minute. Yes. Uh, so I've done some, I've spoken at uh, medical conferences. And number one thing we found with doctors is they need to go in and have a conversation with the patient first yeah. because th- they're in sales. They need to sell the patients on the right course of action. Right now with, the, with vaccines, they, they're salespeople. Time, yeah. uh, so first thing they need to do is they need to figure out how does the patient look when they're talking about sports or the weather or current events. Then they can start talking with them and see How does their face change? How does their posture change? How does their body language change? Mm -hmm. So it's all about figuring out what is the baseline and then what deviations do I see? So if I'm going to try to sell someone on something, I got to sit down and not just jump into the sales pitch because that's all about me. Yeah, I need to just talk with them, build rapport and figure out here's how they look when I'm not trying to influence them. And then when I start influencing them, how did it change? Were they receptive or was there a roadblock that I need to try and overcome? Yeah. You know, that, that's interesting about the baseline. So I, I just, you know, share, share an example and I've done this on scale. So I've done a lot of events in different countries around the world. And so a perfect example of, of how I've misread people is when I've done events in say Singapore. Okay. So if I go to Asia, I'll typically do a tour and I'll do events in Singapore, then in Malaysia, and then sometimes the Philippines as well. And when I start in the Philippines, you know, it's a very warm culture, super friendly people, you know, smiling, happy, you know, um, very, very easy to read, right? Malaysia is a little bit more subdued, but, you know, they're, they're warm. Now, when you walk into a conference room in Singapore, I thought, oh, my God, they hate me. They're all angry. They don't even want to be here. Why are they here? because they have that look on their face of just this intense, just no smile, nothing. Right. And, and, you know, it it took me a while to learn that, that that's their baseline. And it's not that they're angry. That is their, we're here to learn and we're very serious about it. And so, you know, I had to figure out that baseline and realize that that's where they are and it's not what I perceived it to be initially. That's just how they look. Absolutely. 
And before I speak somewhere, first thing, I'm sure you do the same thing is I, I need I need as much information as I can get about the audience. So yeah. I will send a form to the organizer. Tell me who's going to be there. What do they care about? What do they want? What are they interested in? And then also look at cultural differences. So I can figure out how to tailor my message, but also I want to walk in having the right expectations for what the interaction is going to be like. Sure. Yeah. In- very interesting. Okay. So <laughs> now, now, let, let, now let's shift gears and, and really get into this persuasion component of it, right? Um, so, you know, we've talked about sort of the, the, you know, reading the mind, getting inside their head and stuff, right? Now let's get into the persuasion side. Now, I know you've written a whole book on this stuff and there's probably a ton of strategies in there, but, and and obviously, you know, we're not going to go through all those today, but what are, what are, I like to give my listeners something practical that they can take away and, and they can apply, right? So, um, let's talk, you know, what are three, you know, powerful per- persuasion strategies or two or five, I don't care, whatever you want to come up with that, that let's walk through those. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you four uh, because the, the main acronym I use in here is SAIL, which is uh, S is for social proof, A is for authority, L is for likability, and E is for exclusivity. And I have found that those four things, those are the four keys to influence. And uh, just as a quick aside here, I focus on influence as opposed to persuasion because influence is actually getting people to take action. It's that uh, actually moving the audience. It's that compliance gaining. So I'm looking at compliance because uh, there's a lot of things that I'm persuaded about, but I haven't done them. Yes. So (laughs) you can, yeah, I mean, you can persuade me. I I should floss more, save more for the future, be healthier. It's all about the compliance gaming. So I found uh, social proof, authority, likability, and exclusivity really help with this compliance gaming. So I'm sure you, uh, many of your listeners are familiar with portions of this. For social proof, I want to make whatever I'm talking about seem as popular as possible. Mm-hmm. And there, there's the obvious ways of doing this. I mean, the obvious ways would be looking at Amazon or Yelp or uh, eBay. And you can see the number of reviews uh, yeah. says that this is good. That's pretty basic. But there's also a lot more subtle ways of doing this, of just presenting things as being popular by uh, our, the imagery. If we're going to use uh, pictures, I want to show other people. Yeah. Uh, I, I did uh, a presentation with, uh, with people that were at an uh, online dating company. And in discussing with them, they, they found in their internal research Pictures of people when there were others around them helped uh, responses on online dating profiles because what that's saying non-verbally is, look, I'm not creepy. There are other people that can stand my presence. It's social proof. So as long as other people seem interested. So it, whenever you can make it seem as though it's popular by just subtly mentioning other people, showing uh, testimonials, uh, and just working in past stories about other people that were involved in whatever you're talking about, that really helps. Okay. So, so from the, the the doctor professor side of you, why do you think social proof is so important? What, what is the psychological mechanism that makes people go, Oh, other people are doing it. Like, why is that? Well, I, I think just, we evolved to take our cues from other people because it's a whole lot faster. Sure. We have many decisions we have to make on a daily basis. And going along with the crowd is a whole lot easier. Now, sometimes that can be a problem. Peer pressure can turn out negatively if you do bad things with it. But uh, if we were all sitting in a room and everyone around us jumped out of the chairs and started running out of the room and out of the building, we could sit there and analyze it and try to figure out what's going on and why they're doing that. And maybe they were wrong. Maybe it was a false alarm. But immediately we're just going to operate under the assumption that they know something we don't if everyone's running we should probably run too because something is probably chasing us uh there's that old uh example that parents often give if everyone jumped off a bridge would you i would definitely consider jumping off the bridge because people aren't stupid if everyone's jumping off a bridge there's gonna be something pretty bad on that bridge what's behind us what's chasing us yeah yeah absolutely (laughs) you just want to be the last person to land on a 
cushy pile of people. Yeah. Uh, so oftentimes I think it's just, it's in our best interest to follow other right. people. Now we can game that system by influencing the people around. So oftentimes it's not even just getting compliance from other people, it's ourselves. Mm-hmm. If I want to get in shape, the best way of doing that is to hang out with people who are healthy. And then without even thinking about it, I'm going to start doing what they're doing. If I want to be successful, I want to hang around with other people that are successful. Sure. Uh, I want to listen to podcasts like this. I want to just surround myself. And then just without making conscious decisions, I will start moving in that direction just because that's human nature. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. So moving on. So we started with social proof. Next was a... Uh, authority. Yeah. Yes. So social proof, authority. So you don't want to rely on this one too much because it can sound kind of condescending and just annoying. Mm-hmm. But this whole idea of authority, people listen to people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. There's tons of examples of this. Uh, the Milgram experiments where uh, Stanley Milgram actually got people to shock others uh, or to think they were shocking. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I assume most of your listeners are. It, it's very famous. So the basic idea, he got people to think they were shocking other people in this experiment just because someone in a lab coat told them to. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we should not use it to torture people, uh, sure. but this idea of uh, listening to people because of their position of, of knowledge, of power, of expertise really helps. The mm-hmm. TED Talks are a great example of this, where someone walks out and they stand on the big red carpet. Mm-hmm automatically that gives people authority, gives them credibility. Yeah. So we all listen to people, or most of us listen to people who seem like they're experts in that field. And once again, this just goes back to uh, how we evolved, where we're going to listen to people older than us because they probably know stuff we don't know. We listen to someone who has more expertise. So one of the keys here is to come across that way. Now, there's certain things you can do that take a lot of work. So Obviously, as a college professor, I've spent shoot, over a decade of higher education getting to the point where I've researched all this stuff. That's a lot of work. Yeah. There's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of less, uh, less intensive ways of doing sure. this, basically just the way that we dress. So coming across a certain way so you just seem authoritative. And that does not mean dressing formally because mm-hmm. in, our, in our society now, people that dress more formally oftentimes don't have nearly as much power. The mm-hmm. person at Facebook wearing the suit is not the owner. Zuckerberg <laughs> wears uh, yeah. t-shirts and yeah. hoodies. It's his secretary. So basically just dressing more uh, assertive, dressing sure. in a way that it looks like you really took the time, you, you, you're into it, you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's, there's so many studies of this. One of my favorite ones was where some researchers followed people or they watched people in New York city and they had a guy jaywalk just dressed in casual clothes and they counted the number of people that followed him. Then they had the same guy wear a nice expensive three piece suit and jaywalk about three times as many people followed him when he was dressed formally. That makes no sense at all. I don't care how nicely you're dressed. You can still get hit by a car, but people just, Oh, they listened to him because he was, or they followed him because he was dressed formally. Yeah. Yeah. So the way we dress is part of it. Sure. Uh, but part of this is just our assertiveness, just seeming as though we know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, part, of the, part of the look is we, we can't even control it. I mean, I, I've been teaching now for shoot, 18, 19 years. I started when I was 24 in graduate school, mm-hmm. and I looked younger than the students. Mm-hmm. I had a lot more difficult of a time back then taking control of the class. So I had to be more assertive and, and show that I was in charge and I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. The older I've gotten, the easier it becomes. So there's certain things outside of our control, mm-hmm. uh, such as our looks, but that, uh, for that matter, just sounding as though we know what we're talking about and asserting things as though it's a fact, hopefully it is, mm-hmm. and that we know what we're talking about, just asserting ourselves. Yeah. And part of this comes with, uh, with experience. The more the more we deal with a product or service or this, the sales and influence process in general, the easier it's going to be to seem as though we're knowledgeable. And inversely, people are going to be more likely to listen to us. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, there's, there's, you know, a perfect example as well. Something you've done is, is written a book. 
Um, uh, yeah, you know, and, and it's a fascinating thing. You know, I, I know lots of people that have written books, get it published on Amazon, and now they're a published author. And by adding that, you're not bragging yourself up. You're like, I wrote a book. And people immediately add more authority to your, to who you are by doing that, right? And, and, and in reality, you know, anybody in their area could write a simple book and put it on Amazon for the most part. Um, and I'm not saying that's what you did. I mean, obviously, oh, yeah, you, 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 you have a decade of freaking education behind yeah, yeah. you to make that happen. But, <laughs> but there's ways to do that, right? And, and, you know, I do that on my sites and stuff. When you come to, you know, a sales page or a landing page where I have cold traffic that doesn't know me, I'm going to build authority by sharing, you know, uh, places I've been published, right? Um, news, uh, uh, you know, news shows I've been interviewed on, stuff like that. And, and it's, it's here it is. It's, it's not uh, me bragging it up. It's just there, and it's it's supporting that authority. All right, let's move on to L. Well, uh, oh, go ahead. Absolutely, and, and the idea with uh, with authority is it's much easier when it's coming from other people. Sure. So exactly. before, yeah. yeah, before I ever do a training for a company or a keynote for a conference, they have my information, and I want to make sure it's published. I have a whole intro video. Uh, there's a huge introduction, and all that gives my credibility before anyone sees me because. If I go up there and just say, here's the amazing thing I've, things I've done, eh, it's just bragging. Yeah. So it, if you can have other people do that, and like you said, with books, absolutely. Just sure. having, here's something I've published, here's where I've spoken, it builds that credibility. Yeah. Uh, but yes, onto, onto likability. So social proof, authority, likability. Hmm. Likability is one of the most important things mm -hmm. because people want to listen to people they like. Uh, the reason that all these home parties, uh, what do you have? Candles were Tupperware, like candles. Yeah. Tupperware. Stuff, candles, yep, yep, the, yeah. All that stuff. Yep. The reason that stuff is so successful is presumably if I go to one of these things, I like the person that's speaking sure. to me. I, I don't really care if people at Costco or Walmart make money. And even if I did, they don't work on commissions. I don't care if the company makes money. Mm -hmm. So, because I like someone, it's going to work so much better. Uh, so anything we can do to get the people we're dealing with to like us, we're going to have a much easier time of persuading them and influencing them, getting them to take action. And so there's a couple basic techniques here. Uh, one is just that, that first part of the process where we spend time with people, building common ground with them. So I, I, when I first meet someone, I just, and we all do this, I look at them like, oh, what do I have in common with them? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not into sports, but if I were and they're wearing a, a jersey or something of that team, oh, hey, I love that team. Yeah. Um, if we're in a certain area, oh, hey, I grew up there too. Yeah. Or it could be as simple as you have kids, I have kids. You, you like hiking, I like hiking. It could be anything. So building that common ground, we generally like people that have something in common with us. And we aren't that different. We, we can find something in common with sure. pretty much anyone. Yeah. Uh, other things are just this whole idea of reciprocity, mm -hmm. where if we give people something, they will like us and they will want to give us something. Now, in, in a, just a purely transactional mode, you can look at basic things like uh, Costco. Uh, they give you samples. Oh, well, I feel like a jerk if I just ate samples and never bought anything. So I will now buy something. The place I get my tires, they repair tires for free. Well, I would feel like a jerk if I just got tired somewhere else and went to them just to have them repair them. Yeah. So I'm going to give them something. But uh, on a purely human level, uh, just even time, mm -hmm. the most valuable thing we have is time. So giving people our time. If I say, well, I, I want to try and pitch you on this. Uh, I've got, a, I got about five minutes. Let's go. Well, I haven't given you anything. Mm -hmm. If I listen to you, hey, let's hang out for a little while. If we talk for a while, and I'm truly giving you my attention. I turn the phone off. I don't look at my watch. and I'm really focused. We're going to build that relationship a little bit more. And people are far more likely to listen to you. And, and there's so many examples of this, uh, of this whole idea of likability working well to get people to take action. I mean, on a, I'll use a, a large scale kind of example and then much more focused. Uh, Pepsi versus Coke. There, there is the example from 
the, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, the Pepsi Challenge. Yeah. Where in blind taste tests, people preferred Pepsi over Coke. So then Coke came up with New Coke. They put that out there and it failed miserably, even though in blind taste tests, New Coke tasted better. Mm -hmm. But the reason people to this day still prefer Coke, even though it doesn't taste as good, according to that study, is because people like Coca-Cola better. Mm -hmm. It's that it's that brand. It's that emotion. It's polar bears in the North Pole. It's Santa Claus. Yeah. It's family. Uh, so there's broad examples like that, that that took a century to build that brand. Yeah. Uh, but even more focused when we like things more, uh, it, if we associate ourselves with likability, it'll work better. A great example of this is Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. Everyone likes Oprah. Yeah. She's not an expert. She doesn't know more than we do about many things, but she's likable. Yeah. And when she recommends a book, it immediately becomes a bestseller. She likes a product. It sells out. Even in the uh, 2008 election in America, uh, she went on stage with Obama and endorsed him. Yeah. Everywhere that she did that, he went, his ratings went through the roof and his popularity just soared. So oftentimes, if we can just make ourselves likable by spending mm -hmm. time, or if we can associate ourselves with people that are likable, uh, or if we can give people things, either our time or other things, uh, we will be halfway there to building that relationship and hopefully getting people to take action. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, you know, they'll be, you know, I always say in business, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust, right? And absolutely. And, and that's key. I mean, if, if somebody does not like you, they are not going to buy from you. <laughs> um, and and, and, and you know, the same goes for brands, right? You know, if, if what Absolutely. you stand for is not in alignment with their values, you're done. Yeah. And, and I go through this cognitive dissonance when there's someone I don't like who makes a really good point. Like, oh, dear, they're yeah, right, yeah, but yeah, I, I yeah. don't like them. Yeah. Versus if they like them, I'll, I'll cut them a lot of slack. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. <laughs> All right. So now we're at E. Yes. So social proof, authority, likability, and finally E is for exclusivity. Mm -hmm. So people want what is harder to get. Uh, and this is just the basis of supply and demand. If it's harder to get, we really, really want this. And there's things we can do to make it seem more exclusive. And part of this is just Oh, let me look at it. Oh, there, there's a few examples here that just work really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, you figure diamonds aren't really that valuable. Mm -hmm. Intrinsically, it's just a shiny rock. Yeah. Unless you're drilling something hard, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But the beers, the diamond cartel, uh, keeps the supply limited and they slowly release them to make sure they're constantly of value. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what else? Uh, paintings. I, I keep seeing all this artwork that sells yeah. for obscene amounts of money and I can look at the pictures online for free. Yes. So what makes them valuable is the harder it is to get, the more we want it. Yeah. And you can look at countless of examples of this. I mean, shoot, these earbuds I use from Apple, yeah. I went into the store to take a look at them and it's amazing that Apple actually sells more per square foot in their store than any I other company that. on earth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And all it is, is that exclusivity. I went in years ago when these things first came out Mm -hmm. said, I want to, I want to check them out. Yeah. I said, Oh, you can't get these here. Said, this is the Apple store. Where could I get them? Said, oh, there's a six month waiting list. Yeah. So I immediately got on the waiting list. Cause damn, those gotta be amazing. They gotta be good. Uh, absolutely. So for ourselves, I, we can look at countless, countless examples of high end products that have created that exclusivity for us personally, though, if we can make ourselves seem exclusive, mm -hmm. it will make it much easier to, move people to accept whatever we're talking about, or if we can make whatever we're pitching seem exclusive. Uh, so the example I give my students is if they're going out and they're going to uh, be applying for a job, when they're called for an interview, don't jump at it too quickly. I mean, say yes, go to the interview. But mm -hmm. if they say, uh, we, we've got an opening, are you available for an interview? If the response is, absolutely, I will be there day or night, you just let me know when to be there. Mm -hmm. eh, you sound like you don't have options. Mm -hmm. But if they say, well, let me check my schedule and they're probably free, they'll make it. But if they make it seem a little bit more, eh, I, I need to yeah. check, it works a whole lot better. Yeah. Uh, same thing for dating. Want to go out sometime? 
I don't have to check my schedule. Damn, they got to be popular versus absolutely I'll meet you anywhere. Yeah. Okay, there's a problem there. Uh, Penn and Teller are a good example of this. Um, for those that don't know, Penn is very is, is the speaking yeah. <laughs> uh, part of the duo. Teller does not talk. Yeah. Uh, Teller actually speaks very eloquently. There's no physical problem. What happened was in San Francisco in the 70s, they were street performers. And Teller would go out there and he'd yell and scream and try to get people to listen to him. It didn't work. So then he started whispering. And then eventually he stopped talking. When he stopped talking, people wanted to find out more because if I'm yelling to everyone, then it's not exclusive. He stopped talking. It's only for people that are around him. So people gathered close. Uh, so the more we scream and shout and yell and try to get people into it, the less interesting it seems. So I want to say this is just for us. If you want people to listen, whisper. Mm -hmm. If you want people to want to see you, make it harder to see you. Schedule appointments so that you have to schedule a week in advance. And then not everyone's going to show up, but people that do, they're interested. They're intrigued because mm -hmm. you're harder to reach. Uh, so it, it, it's a subtle way of the over the board, uh, technique that's used online. Find out what doctors don't want you to know. Doctors mm -hmm. don't care whether you know it. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is yeah. Yeah, if doctors don't want you to know it, uh, first of all, they don't care, but if so, it's probably not medical advice, <laughs> but by doing that, it makes it seem like, well, they don't want us to see that. I, I got to check it out. Yeah. We're doing the same thing more subtly with us. I'm whispering, well, I don't want people in the back to hear. So it, it draw it gets people to to totally. draw in and, yeah, and be yeah. more excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, it's been a fascinating conversation. And as we're wrapping up, though, I, you know, I, I, where do people find out more? The last question, oh, absolutely. How, how can people learn more about this from you? Aside okay. from going well, and rolling in your courses at your uh, university. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, well, Dr. Carl Reads Minds is my website. Yep. And uh, you can go there and find out more about my book and my uh, my keynotes, my trainings. And uh, normally I am all across the country, uh, all over North America, uh, doing keynotes and trainings. Last year and a half, I've been virtually all over the place uh, from my home. And so yep. I'm uh, starting to get out there more, starting to uh, book things. So I will be uh, starting a tour pretty soon here. Uh, but feel free to go to my website, Dr. Carl Reads Minds, to find out more about uh, my information. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you being here and sharing these strategies with us. And I, it's just a fascinating topic and, and one that anybody in life, I think, is going to benefit from. Absolutely. Uh, and I always say we're all in sales. It doesn't matter if this is how you make your living. We're all trying to persuade people, our family, friends, coworkers, mm -hmm. to make good decisions. And that's all the process of totally. influence and persuasion. My God, Absolutely. every day I'm trying to convince my kids to do stuff. <laughs> 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 constant well thank you so much for being here i really appreciate it and hopefully we can do this again sometime absolutely thank you so much take care all right everybody and uh now it's your turn uh as i always say if you actually want to benefit from what you've learned here today is you got to use it and there was a lot of practical actionable stuff that can be applied one-on-one -on -one or even one to many uh so just write down a few of the things that you learned and that you're going to start practicing next time you're in a in a, a meeting with somebody maybe it's a sales meeting uh online whatever uh Ask yourself, you know, what what are their what are their facial expressions telling you, and and be more aware of that person and start implementing the stuff that Carl was talking about, and probably go pick up his book too, because I suspect there's a lot more in there, and we go, he's probably going to go into a lot more detail as well. So, uh, as always, if you like what you heard today, please uh, leave me a rating, leave me a review wherever you listen to your podcast, and as usual, all of the links, anything mentioned here will be included on the show notes at projectignite.com. This is your host, Derek Gale, signing off. Thanks for listening to another info-packed episode of the Project Ignite podcast with Derek Gale. Any links mentioned along with an entire transcript of this episode can be found at projectignite.com slash podcast. And to make sure you never miss another episode, go to iTunes or SoundCloud now and subscribe.